Link TV presents Mosaic World News from the Middle East. Here are today's top stories. Bashar al-Assad defends Syria as the last stronghold of secularism in the region. World groups organize a global day of action in support of Myanmar's Rohingyas. And bombings kill several people in Iraq and Pakistan. Mosaic, world news from the Middle East, begins now. With the backing of the international community, an extensive meeting was held by the Syrian opposition in Doha to unify its fronts. The Syrian National Council elected 40 new members. Al-Arabi said the only way to end the conflict in Syria is through a political solution, and Al-Assad declared that he will live and die in Syria. The opposition Syrian National Council elected a new leadership consisting of 40 members, with Islamists constituting a third of the members, including five from the Muslim Brotherhood. The Secretariat members will choose 11 members for the executive office, which then elects the president. The process was postponed until Friday, so an additional four members can be chosen for the general secretariat that would represent women and minorities. Outgoing President Abdel Basit Saida remained a member in the new general secretariat. However, prominent opponents such as Burhan Ghalyoun, Jar Sabra and Riyad Saif left so they cannot preside over the council on principle. We will look into the different issues, including forming an authority, commission or government. The name is not important, but it is work that is essential and aims to administer the liberated areas and address the current tasks. Unifying the opposition is not a concession that can be offered for a price for this state or for the friends of Syria. Unifying the opposition is a duty for all spectrums of the Syrian opposition, and we are continuing until the opposition is unified, despite the reactions and the demands of other countries. During a closed meeting, Qatari Prime Minister Sheikh Hamad bin Jassim al Thani called on the Syrian opposition to unite its fronts. The Secretary General of the Arab League, Nabil al Arabi, announced that the regime in Syria will not last long. The military solution will not end the problem, so we must look for a political solution that is able to achieve the desired outcome. The political solution comes through Lakhtar Brahimi, the joint envoy of the United Nations and the Arab League. He is seeking to establish the means to reaching a political solution. He still has not settled on a specific way. Consultations with influential parties are important, and he is talking with all sides. Then at the right time, he will make a decision. On the other hand, the spokesman for the Syrian Foreign Ministry, Jihad al-Maqdisi, responded to Al-Arabi by saying it's not surprising for Al-Arabi to repeat his anti-Syria statements, in which he fantasizes about changing the political system of a founder of the Arab League, an organization Al-Arabi works for as an employee for its member states. In an unrelated matter, following the Russian and Armenian planes, another Armenian plane was headed to Syria in less than a month. It was loaded with humanitarian aid but was forced to land by Turkey on Thursday morning at Erzurum airport in the northeastern part of the country to be searched. After a full inspection, sources noted that Turkish authorities did not find weapons on the plane and did not find anything except for 15 tons of food supplies and humanitarian aid. Politically, in an interview with TV channel Russia Today, Syrian President Bashar al-Assad warned that if it were to happen, the cost of a foreign invasion of Syria will be greater than what the entire world can handle. He compared its impact to a domino effect that will involve the world from the Atlantic Ocean to the Pacific Ocean. I'm not a puppet. I wasn't, made by, I wasn't made by the West. I strongly reject the idea of leaving Syria or going to any other country. I am not a puppet, and I was not made by the West to go to the West or to any other country. I am Syrian. I was made in Syria, and I will live and die in Syria. Internationally, Russia announced that the situation in Syria is worrisome. The official spokesman for the Russian Foreign Ministry, Alexander Lukashevich, said the number of those in need of humanitarian aid in Syria will increase to 4 million at the end of the year. He confirmed that his country will continue its efforts on all levels to stop the violence in the country.
Erdogan is continuing his weeping over the Syrian people while ignoring that he's a main player in their bloodshed. Today he's touring the north, south, east and west in an attempt to save face before the Turkish people after the United States pulled the rug out from under him. Once again, Erdogan appoints himself emperor of the Middle East through the gateway of the Syrian crisis. He continues escalating and intimidating the country by going to Bali in Indonesia to attend the Global Forum on Democracy. He rose to the podium to give advice about his supposed democracy, forgetting that his house is made of glass. Erdogan's democracy forced him and his government to lead the world's championship in silencing opposition journalists and arresting them, as reported by international organizations. The democracy he boasts before the world also forced him to arrest Kurdish politicians and deputies who are on a hunger strike in his prisons. His democracy, which he wishes for the Syrian people and cries for, speaks for itself through the suppression of protests and the closure of cities facing demonstrators rebelling against his hostile policy towards Syria and the countries of the region. Erdogan has reached a point of no return. So he went on a quest with rhetoric that conflicts with his actions, claiming concern for the Syrian people while ignoring the fact that he's one of the most important figures responsible for the bloodshed of the Syrians. He did so after turning Turkey into the biggest base cultivating terrorism and exporting it to Syria. In a trip aspiring to resurrect the extinct empire of his Ottoman ancestors, Erdogan is still far away from reality, disobeying history with flimsy dreams at times. Dreams of imposing a different presidential system on Turkey through a new constitution that aims to create an Ottoman Empire and a monopoly on power. And at times, he demands changes to the United Nations and the Security Council. Occasionally, he attempts to work in the service of the Americans in hopes of receiving a share of the region. But he hasn't woken up from these dreams, despite the repeated slaps he receives from his American master. The latest was denying the Erdogan government's attempt to dispatch Patriot missiles on the border with Syria after Ankara submitted a request, as reported by the MTV channel quoting Erdogan's foreign minister, Ahmet Davutoglu. On to Myanmar, Rohingya Muslims continue to face persecution amid the silence of the international community. Rohingya organizations around the world have declared November 8 a global day of action to draw attention to the plight of Rohingyas in the country. A rally is being held in their support in London. Christopher correspondent Amina Taylor has spoken to the president of Arakan Rohingya National Organization. Here's what he had to say. We want the international community to speak out. And they, uh, although this is, a, this is a case which can be considered a case of genocide, mm -hmm. given the intention, which is very much um, manifest now, but the international response is very poor, they should send the international community, particularly these uh, powerful countries, they should send clear message to the Tenzing government that uh, ethnic cleansing and crimes against humanity against the Rohingya people is not acceptable. The government has failed manifestly to give protection to the Rohingya people. Not only that, even its forces and army, police and security forces are directly involved in the killing of the Rohingya people, raping of the Rohingya women and destruction and attention of their houses. They are now conducting a migration check to look for the so-called illegal immigrant. Actually, there is no illegal immigrant in Burma who will be going to Burma this is since the last 60, 60 years. It has been a hell for the Rohingya people. Regarding Aung San Suu Kyi, we believe that she could uh, have uh, reduced or stopped the violence in Arkhan if she has a respect for the human rights of the Rohingya people. But uh, I think if uh, Rakhine Buddhists are in a situation of the situation of the Rohingya, she would definitely speak out. The American Muslim charity organization, the Holy Land Foundation, has been denied a hearing by the U.S. Supreme Court. The foundation was once the largest Islamic charity in the United States. But in 2008, five of its members were convicted of supporting terrorism. Marjan Asi reports. The case against the Holy Land Foundation charity and five of its members has been effectively sealed. 
Defense attorneys attempted to overturn the prison sentences for the charity workers by taking the case to the highest court in the U.S., but the appeal was declined late last month without explanation. You have such stiff sentences for what people were actually accused of. They were not accused of providing mon money directly to Hamas to commit acts of terror. So you have 65-year sentences. Um, it, it worries one because, you know, will this become a pattern for the Supreme Court? As the largest American Muslim charity organization of its time, the Holy Land Foundation focused mainly on helping Palestinian refugees through different avenues like providing scholarships, sending food, building hospitals, and sponsoring orphans. During the Bush administration, the charity's offices were raided and members arrested on terror funding allegations. But due to a lack of evidence, the case was thrown out of court the first time. The government then took the case to court again, this time using secret testimony from unidentified Israeli witnesses, resulting in the sentences of the five HLF members. Professor John Esposito of Georgetown University, who served as an expert witness for the defense, discussed the increasingly problematic issue of civil rights for American Muslims. And it continues to be a question with regard to civil rights and civil liberties of immigrants in general and of Muslims in particular. Um, and in fact, in the last year or two, if you talk to lawyers who handle a lot of these Muslim civil liberties cases, they will say that ironically, more cases have been generated under President Obama, unfortunately, than even under Bush. Nor had a parting message to her father, who is being held in the communications management union of an Illinois prison, commonly dubbed Little Guantanamo's because of the large Muslim and Middle Eastern populations of inmates. The remaining options for the Holy Land Five are commuting the sentence or a presidential pardon, both of which are rare in the U.S. Marjanasi Press TV, Washington. Two people were killed and another five were injured in two explosions in the district of Al-Mahmudiyah, south of Baghdad. Security sources said the first explosion was the result of an explosive canister, while the other, which occurred five minutes later, was the result of a car bomb detonated near a crowd of citizens in one of Al-Mahmudiyah's neighborhoods. The city of Al-Hala also witnessed a car bombing that led to the killing of four people and injury of 20 others. At least one person was killed and ten others were injured after a truck packed with explosives was blown up. The bombing targeted a compound housing a paramilitary force in the city of Karachi in western Pakistan. Karachi is Pakistan's largest city and its financial capital. Some people said they saw a small truck loaded with vegetables explode into bits near an office of the paramilitary force. It killed and injured people and devastated the police building in the surrounding neighborhoods. The truck was a Mazda. I think it was loaded with vegetables. It crashed into the building's main entrance, then exploded and flames started to rise. We were far from the building, but we were injured. I don't know what happened after that. I was lying down in an alleyway near my house when I saw a truck speeding toward the main entrance of the paramilitary force building. Then I heard a large explosion, so I ran to check on my family that lives in a building nearby. The duties of the paramilitary force that use this building as their headquarters is to support the Pakistani police in ensuring the security of the residents of the city which is inhabited by 18 million people. While no side has claimed responsibility for the incident, the city of Karachi occasionally witnesses attacks by extremist organizations that target both police officers and civilians. Israeli media outlets reported a wide gap in the future relations between Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu and American President Barack Obama. This comes a day after disappointment was expressed by Likud party government ministers. The future of the relationship between American President Obama and Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu was the most prominent headline in Israeli media outlets. 
The consensus was that Netanyahu was hasty and made a major mistake by what was described as a blatant intervention in favor of the Republican candidate, Romney, that was done without assessing the possibility of Obama's return to the White House. Netanyahu tried to rectify the situation and issued strict orders to all his ministers, their advisors, and Likud members in the Knesset not to speak about Obama's victory without coordinating with his office. This came following Likud party members' negative reaction towards Obama, who they described as not good for Israel and unreliable. However, others described the relationship between Washington and Tel Aviv as at its best. Columnist Akiva Eldar wrote an article published in the Israel Today newspaper saying that Obama will repay the Jewish community that voted for him. International media also commented on the issue, but that reaction mostly differed from the Israeli analysis. The Guardian newspaper said Obama's re-election makes him more able, less confined, and more free to deal with Israel, suggesting that Obama will pressure Netanyahu to stop settlement construction, especially in East Jerusalem. The British newspaper recalled Netanyahu's disappointment by saying that the person who most regretted Obama's victory, after Romney, was the Israeli Prime Minister, who not only opposed Obama, but also publicly mocked him in the corridors of the United Nations when he lectured him on Jewish history. Turning now to politics, and while the United States is taking a breather after the re-election of President Barack Obama, here in Israel, the meaning of his victory has been a main topic of discussion. Will it impact on U.S.-Israel relations? Will it affect Israel's elections in January? Here to tackle those questions is IBA's political reporter, Eli Walgalanter. Eli? Yes, Laura, the contentious issue of who Israeli officials allegedly supported in this election has raised a number of issues of concern. The assumption by most political pundits is that Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu backed the wrong horse, that his supposed meddling in the U.S. elections by being overly warm to Mitt Romney has severely risked Israel's relationship with Washington. Netanyahu never explicitly took sides in the presidential race, and there's been no proof of any meddling. But whoever wanted to read between the lines could see that Netanyahu preferred the Republican challenger to the incumbent. In a meeting yesterday with U.S. Ambassador Dan Shapiro, Netanyahu seemed eager to offer congratulations to Obama. I want to congratulate President Obama on his re-election. Mm -hmm. I think the United States of America again demonstrated why it's the greatest democracy on earth. The security relationship between the United States and Israel is rock solid, and I look forward to working with President Obama to further strengthen this relationship, and I look forward to working with him to advance our goals of peace and security. So I want to congratulate him on behalf of the people of Israel. Thank you. Thank you. Well, Mr. Prime Minister, on behalf of the President, the Vice President, and the American people, thank you for this. Americans are very proud of our democratic values and our free elections. Obviously, Israelis share those values. Uh, the president has uh, enjoyed uh, the close security cooperation and the close coordination with you and your government in his first term. And I know he looks forward to continuing in his second term. Great. Later at a panel discussion on the election, Ambassador Shapiro insisted that there would be no change in the relationship, while former Israeli ambassador to the U.S. Salai Meridor suggested that Obama may indeed hold a grudge. All of the close cooperation that has been uh, a, a central feature uh, of that relationship uh, before the Obama administration and during the Obama administration uh, will continue uh, in the second term of the Obama administration, as I'm sure it would have in the Romney administration, by the way. So uh, for my money, uh, uh, very little uh, has changed, and I don't expect a great deal would have changed, uh, even with a different result. And I assume that uh, when people fight for their political life, and have a perception that uh, their partner is trying to, uh, by the way, I think it's mutual, uh, to undermine their, uh, their chances, it is not disappearing overnight. So it will take, in my view, uh, some work in order to overcome it. Whether it's perception or reality, the issue is sure to be raised by numerous politicians in Israel's upcoming election. The right-wingers will argue that Israel needs a strong leader who can stand up for Israel's interests, regardless of what the Americans say, while the left-wingers will argue that Netanyahu's ruined the, Israel's relationship with its most important ally. 
As for the Jewish vote in the U.S. election, the polls released yesterday pretty much confirmed the snap exit polls that we reported yesterday. 70% of the Jewish electorate voted for Obama, while 30% said they voted for Romney. In 2008, Obama took 78% of the Jewish vote, while Senator John McCain, the Republican nominee, won 22%. And how Jewish will the new Congress look? While Jews make up only 2% of the U.S. population, it will now have 10 members of the Senate and 22 members of the House, all of whom are Democrats, except Rep Rep Representative Eric Cantor of Virginia. That's an overall decline from 2010, when 12 Jews were elected to the Senate and 27 to the House. Reuters news agency sources revealed that Royal Dutch Shell Company aims to circumvent international sanctions imposed on Iran by concluding a swap deal through which it would pay its debt to the Iranian National Oil Company. In an attempt to tighten the noose on Iran so it gives up its nuclear program, early this year the European Union added its voice to that of the United States by imposing sanctions on the government of Tehran that include prohibiting the import of Iranian oil. European countries granted their oil companies a six-month grace period to adhere to the sanctions. During the grace period, these companies were worked on gradually decreasing their dependence on Iranian oil. As large companies stopped buying Tehran's oil, Sources revealed to Reuters agency that the Royal Dutch Shell Company, Tehran's second largest customer that imports 100,000 barrels of Iranian oil per day, continued to purchase oil until the sanctions went into effect on July 1st. As the scope of the sanctions was expanded to prohibiting financial transactions with Iranian banks and companies, Shell was unable to pay its dues, amounting to $1.4 billion, to the Iranian National Oil Company, especially especially after the British government refused to give the company permission to pay off this debt through bank transfers. These sanctions forced Royal Dutch Shell to look for other means to settle its debt. According to Reuters, the company is currently trying to arrange a grain barter deal through the American agribusiness Cargill. Through this deal, Shell will deliver grains to Iran worth $1.4 billion or what amounts to nearly 80% of Iran's yearly import of grains. Shell hopes the deal receives the approval of the American, British and Dutch authorities since the export of grains, food products and essential supplies to Iran is permitted on humanitarian grounds despite the sanctions. The participants in Darfur's peace process are undertaking serious efforts to continue the process by communicating with movements that reject peace. These efforts continued after the justice and equality movement accepted the Doha Charter following consultations conducted with the government in the Qatari capital, Doha. On the other hand, the regional police in Darfur formed a communication committee to invite the remaining movements to the peaceful settlement process that was adopted in the Doha Charter and which is positively reflected on most issues in Darfur. Between July 2011, the date the Doha Charter was signed between the government and the Liberation and Equality Movement, and November 2012, many issues have been tackled. Following the agreement, a new reality started to take shape, a reality that is headed toward an entrenched and expanding peace while popular optimism is growing daily as the impact of the Charter is being felt. Since signing the Doha Charter, Darfur no longer makes headlines on international media outlets the way it did before. The hectic actions of some parties have slowed down, actions that were mostly escalating the conflict and were seen as one-sided. On the regional front, some countries have shifted their stance in favor of peace in Darfur. At the same time, regimes that have long inflamed the struggle there are now gone, and the international community's stance seems more clear in its support for calming the situation in rejecting war. The international position was clarified when it broadly endorsed the Doha Agreement and the formation of a mechanism to follow up on its implementation, including a number of African and Arab countries and the member states at the Security Council.
the Organization of Islamic Conference and the European Union also supported the initiative. In the states of Darfur, the positive impact of the Doha document has started to be felt. The displaced are now thinking about their future and considering returning to their homes and lands. According to reports by organizations working in Sudan, all indicators point to an improvement in the humanitarian and security conditions. The people of Darfur started to realize the negative role the Western media machine played due to its desire to turn the area into a stage for ethnic strife. For this reason, tribal committees for reconciliation are active now, and special courts were formed to prosecute those committing crimes against civilians. Communication with armed groups was also re-established, contact that led the justice and equality movement to join the peace march in accordance with the Doha Agreement. The agreement was centered on seven items based on Darfur's essential needs for which armed movements had established themselves. According to arms control monitors, the time to lay down arms has come since there is no longer a reason for an armed struggle. The contact committee dealing with armed groups, which was recently formed by the regional authority, needs regional and international support to successfully accomplish its mission. The views expressed on Mosaic are from contributing broadcasters, not Link TV or its sponsors. The production of Mosaic is made possible by grants from the John D. and Catherine T. MacArthur Foundation, the Winco Foundation, the Firedall Foundation, and by support of viewers like you. Thank you. Watch Mosaic World News online. Stay up to date with breaking news, read our blog, get transcripts of past shows and more at linktv.org slash mosaic. channel of uncompromising stories, world news, documentaries, entertainment, and culture. Link TV, connecting you to the world. For more information, visit linktv.org.